Hi, and welcome to Kidney Plugged In. Joining us today is nephrologist Dr. Marianne Park, who's here to talk about and demystify peritoneal dialysis. So don't go anywhere because you'll meet Dr. Park next right here on Kidney Plugged In. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Park. I thought we could start by having you explain um, what is dialysis and when in a kidney patient's journey do they need to start dialysis? So dialysis is a therapy that removes waste, salt, and extra water from the body when our kidneys are no longer able to do it themselves any longer. Um, it can also keep certain chemicals in our bodies at balance as well, such as sodium, potassium, and bicarbonate levels. Again, when the kidneys are no longer able to regulate this anymore. Patients with chronic kidney disease over time progress and develop end-stage renal disease, at which point generally patients require dialysis as a life-sustaining therapy. And we know that patients require dialysis because of a few different features. First being the actual biochemical features. So when we're doing blood work and we see that patients are developing high levels um, and sometimes dangerous levels of certain chemicals in the body, we know that we need to start talking about dialysis to keep things safe for the patients. Other times, these are signs and symptoms that patients develop over time that gives us a clue that they're nearing requiring dialysis. So for example, patients may develop signs of volume overload meaning developing shortness of breath, uh, increasing weight gain, uh, and swelling around their legs or other parts of their body. Or patients may develop signs of uremia, which are symptoms that develop when patients have toxins build up in their bodies from their kidney disease. And some patients may say they have increasing fatigue, uh, loss of appetite, increased itching, as well as nausea and other abdominal symptoms as well. Again, all of these signs and symptoms with their blood work combined generally gives us a sense of when patients need to start dialysis. So I understand that there are generally two types of dialysis, peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. Can you briefly explain the difference between the two? Yes. So hemodialysis is a type where it's intermittent typically and patients require their blood to go through a hemodialysis machine to get it cleaned of all of these toxins and the extra water for removal. And then the same blood is then returned to the patient. And each session like this can generally take about three to four hours for completion. And patients require this approximately three to four times a week. And of course, the actual duration and the frequency depends on each patient a little bit. This type of dialysis can be done in a hospital setting or in a dialysis unit away from a hospital or in their own homes. Peritoneal dialysis is more of a 24 hours a day, seven days a week type of therapy where patients always have a special fluid called dialysate in their abdomen. And this dialysate helps draw out the toxins and the fluids that which then you subsequently drain out of your abdomen to get rid of the, the waste products. Um, this type of dialysis is always done at home, uh, not in a hospital setting. So peritoneal dialysis is referred to as one of the home dialysis modalities in dialysis. So how does a patient decide what is the best type of dialysis for them? So we leave a lot of the decisions up to the patient to decide what type of dialysis works best for them because all types of dialysis, whether it be hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis are generally equal in terms of eff effectiveness, um, in terms of clearing the toxins and in terms of the longevity of the patients who stay on dialysis. Um, the features that we think are important to consider are mostly lifestyle considerations for each of the patients to determine if a particular type of dialysis is better uh, than another type of dialysis. So for instance, patients who are still actively working and require a lot of flexibility in terms of what time of day and how frequently they can do dialysis, we think that home dialysis is better because it offers a lot more flexibility in terms of how often and when to do their dialysis. Patients who also value traveling a lot find it a little bit difficult to do other types of dialysis other than home dialysis 
because there are a little bit more restrictions in terms of when and how you can travel to ensure that you can continue getting dialysis at your travel destination. So patients who do home dialysis are able to continue doing their dialysis in their home, in their travel destinations, which makes it a little bit easier for them to travel as well. So for um, patients um, considering peritoneal dialysis, uh, probably one of the uh, big advantages would be that it is done at home and it does allow them to have that, that flexibility. Are there any other things that would make a patient a good candidate for, for PD? I think patients who are motivated and demonstrate interest in doing dialysis themselves at home to gain the benefit of that extra flexibility as well as independence over their own dialysis care are generally all quite good candidates for home dialysis. Um, there are a few instances where we do feel that peritoneal dialysis may not be the best type of dialysis for you. And generally, there's very few medical contraindications, but the few that we do think about uh, include patients with um, frequent bouts of diverticulitis or have inflammatory bowel disease because these patients tend to have more adhesions or scarring in their abdomen. And similarly, patients who've had a lot of abdominal surgeries in the past or a lot of infections and complications in their abdomen, we also find that because of the adhesions and the scarring, sometimes peritoneal dialysis is not as effective. And in instances of diverticulitis and other infections, it also increases your risk of developing abdominal infections uh, with peritoneal dialysis as well. So we worry a little bit more about these patients and it's individualized patient to patient to decide if it is a good idea to start uh, peritoneal dialysis for these patients or not. Other personal and more social factors that we do think about are whether if patients actually have enough space in their homes to have PD related supplies in their homes to be able to do peritoneal dialysis and whether they can physically do things such as picking up their dialysis solutions or making connections uh, for peritoneal dialysis to happen uh, for their exchanges. And of course, we have lots of ways to get over these barriers as well. So if they have a dedicated caregiver or a partner, family member who can assist these patients with some of these activities, it's certainly absolutely possible uh, to train these patients for home dialysis and they can work as a team to continue providing uh, home dialysis for these patients. Stay tuned for more of our special series on peritoneal dialysis with Dr. Marion Park. Leave me a message and I'll get back to you. I can't believe it's been almost 20 years since we met. My whole life has changed. Whenever I felt alone, you were there for me. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I couldn't have done it without the Kidney Foundation. And now, I need you more than ever. Have you checked out the Kidney Wellness Hub? We're excited to share this new online kidney community engagement platform created for kidney patients and caregivers. It offers tons of kidney customized resources and tools to support you on your health and wellness journey. We know living with kidney disease can be challenging, and anyone trying to stay active knows it can be overwhelming to start. But you are not alone. There's information, video content, and resources designed to help you stay active. Classes at various energy levels include yoga, strength training, People flat on the wall, cardio, make it fast, Pilates, dance, and more. Plus, we have chair classes for anyone with mobility issues. Many of our instructors are also affected by kidney disease. They get it, and they bring this personal experience to their classes. We all know eating well is important. But making good food choices is hard, let alone kidney-friendly food choices. Sometimes we just need a little help and inspiration in the kitchen. Our Eating Well section is a great place to learn about kidney-friendly nutritional options wherever you are on your kidney journey. Be sure to check out the Kidney Community Kitchen. 
with meal planners, cooking demos, kidney-friendly recipes, and don't miss the opportunity to test your cooking skills in one of our live cooking classes. In this section, we've put together some tools and resources to help you boost your mental well-being. There's a meditation series with breathing exercises, techniques on how to build more laughter into your life, and how to benefit from music therapy, to name just a few. Don't miss our free kidney wellness coaching sessions to help support you to make those positive changes in your life. And key to your well-being, you told us you wanted to talk with others, to share lived experiences and meet new kidney friends. The Kidney Wellness Hub is here to help. Some of the ways you can connect are talking one-to-one -one with a peer mentor, joining a networking session, or connecting through our Facebook group. Join the Kidney Wellness Hub today. It's easy and free. You'll get updates to new content and special contests for members. Plus, you'll also receive an online copy of our Kidney Customized Wellness Journal. Don't forget to share your feedback as we continue to build and grow. See you online soon. Dr. Park, I understand there are two types of peritoneal dialysis. I'm wondering if you can briefly explain the difference between the two. So the first type of dialysis, or sorry, the first type of peritoneal dialysis is called uh, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, or CAPD. And this is a type that doesn't require any fancy apparatus or any machines. Um, all you require is a bag of dialysate that you're filling your abdomen with and then an empty dry bag that you can um, use to get rid of the dialysate that's already in your abdomen. That's called one exchange when you empty your abdomen of your current dialysate and then you're filling your abdomen with the new dialysate. And generally that's something that takes about maybe half an hour for each exchange. And most patients have to do it approximately four to five times a day um, every four to six hours, uh, except for the longer period of time during which they're sleeping. Um, and it's easy to travel with because again, there's no other machines or any other apparatuses you need to carry around other than your fluids of, of dialysate. APD uh, or uh, automated peritoneal dialysis is a special type of peritoneal dialysis that you can do using a machine called Cycler. And the cycler literally cycles the exchanges through um, as you stay hooked up to the machine. And generally the machine will undergo somewhere between four to six cycles of dialysate. And this happens over approximately an eight to 10 hour period. So patients will generally have to stay connected to the cycler for that duration of time, which is why most patients elect to do this in the nighttime when they're sleeping which is the best time for them to be stay connected to the machine the entire time. And um, it of course provides the extra convenience that you don't have to do any exchanges throughout the day, um, but patients may elect not to travel with their machine and go back to doing their manual exchanges or CAPD during traveling time because it makes it a little bit easier. But those are generally the two options of doing peritoneal dialysis. Once a patient opts to do peritoneal dialysis, what sorts of training and preparation can they expect? So once a patient decides that they want to do peritoneal dialysis, then we wait, of course, until indications arise for them to actually start dialysis. Um, and once we start to see these indications that the patients are nearing dialysis requirement, we have the patient go either up, get a surgically or a bedside uh, place peritoneal dialysis catheter in their abdomen. Um, depending on their other medical comorbidities, we can decide which one is more appropriate for them. And once they have the peritoneal dialysis catheter, which is a plastic tube that gets placed in their abdomen, we generally like to wait approximately three to four weeks to ensure that there is good healing of the tube before we start to use it for training. We do tend to bring patients back once a week or so just to flush the catheter and get some blood work done to make sure that there are no acute indications to start them on dialysis any sooner than we had planned. Um, and just to ensure that the catheter is in the right position and it's working well. 
After about three to four weeks of healing period, we'll bring the patients in alone or with a caregiver to start training for peritoneal dialysis. And generally, peritoneal dialysis is a very easy therapy for patients to learn. And we don't normally need more than about three to five days of uh, training time uh, where they learn the steps of um, doing their dialysis for themselves at home. Once they've completed their three to five days of training, we go through their medications and make sure that they're on all the right dialysis related medications. Then we send them on their way home to start doing dialysis at home. And once they're at home, we do monitor them a little bit closely in the first few weeks, just to ensure that everything is going okay at home and there's no troubleshooting that is required. Um, and so the nurses, the doctors, the dietitians, the all the multidisciplinary teams basically keep a closer eye on them and make sure they're well supported in their first few weeks. And I understand too, there's, you know, there's new developments happening all the time with respect to research and development to help improve the, the quality of care for kidney patients. And um, you know, there's, there's technology out there that's fairly new, I think called ShareSource, and it helps around remote patient monitoring. I'm wondering if you might be able to just comment on you know, how ShareSource um, might help both patients and doctors. Thanks, Deb. So as you've mentioned, there's newer developments in peritoneal dialysis all the time um, to make PD more accessible and easier for patients to learn and continue therapies at home in a more safe fashion. Uh, ShareSource is one of the new developments where, as you've mentioned, allows physicians and all teams of the healthcare uh, providers to monitor patients' therapies at home a little bit more closely and makes it a little bit easier for the patients to keep track of their therapies as well. So traditionally what would happen uh, would be with each day of their dialysis and each of their exchanges, the patients would have a logbook where they would manually keep track of all of their dialysis related numbers, including their blood pressures, their weight, how much dialysate is going in versus coming out, whether their dwell times and et cetera. And the technicalities of this are important for us to make sure that they're getting good proper dialysis each day and that there are no other troubleshooting uh, things that we need to do to make their dialysis more optimal. ShareSource allows for a lot of these numbers to be recorded automatically by the Cycler machine. And anytime the patients are experiencing any alarms or any weird numbers essentially and they're not really sure how to troubleshoot at that point they can contact their primary pd team and the pd team has access to the share source numbers immediately and they can go into it online and help them shoot and see where the issues are which makes it very convenient in terms of communication and monitoring for both the healthcare providers and also for the patients um, if there were any dialysis prescriptions that would need to be altered, uh, the also convenient factor with ShareSource and AMIA is that uh, the healthcare provider could go in remotely and change the prescription for the patient as well, as opposed to having to explain the steps to the patient who would then have to go do it themselves. So there are definitely a little bit of increased efficiency and better communication with the healthcare providers and with the patients um, with this remote monitoring technology. Thanks for that. I think, you know, one of the things probably that comes up for patients that ought to do dialysis from home is just the fact that they're not in a healthcare setting and maybe sometimes just a bit nervous if something should go wrong. But, you know, with, with new technology developments, it, it, you know, they've got not only their healthcare team surrounding them, but they've got the comfort knowing that somebody can monitor and they've got access to people 24 seven, which makes the process a little bit more uh, comfortable, I would assume. Um, please stay with us. We'll be back shortly with more of our interview with Dr. Park. Hi, I'm Kate Chong, Manager of Patient Services for the Kidney Foundation. And this is Did You Know? Did you know that many people are unaware of the programs and services designed to support kidney patients and their caregivers here in British Columbia? Our short-term financial assistance program is in place to provide financial support to kidney patients at a time of crisis or when there has been an unexpected expense. 
The Kidney Foundation recognizes that many of the expenses associated with kidney disease are borne directly by patients and their families, and that often financial hardships is an additional stressor in their lives. Renal social workers may apply for grants for their low-income patients for unexpected household expenses, extraordinary travel, and other pressing needs. Any patient in BC or the Yukon who needs a kidney transplant must travel to Vancouver for transplant surgery and recovery. This usually entails remaining in Vancouver for about two months post-surgery. In order to support these patients, the BC and Yukon branch has established seven kidney suites. These fully furnished units are free for eight weeks for low-income patients and just $35 per night for those above the financial threshold. We have made sure to offer accommodation for a variety of demographics. There's a three bedroom townhouse for families, a child friendly two bedroom near the St. Paul's Transplant Hospital, and even a suite that caters to the most senior population. Our branch offers a number of brochures and manuals that are available for free. Most popular are the living with reduced kidney function and living with kidney failure, often distributed to kidney patients through the kidney care clinics. They're also available to individuals. Kidney patients and their caregivers can always call the patient services department and chat with a staff member who can answer their kidney related questions. Although staff are not providing medical advice, they are there to assist patients with questions about their kidney diagnosis, diet related questions, to explain lab test results and to direct callers to other appropriate resources. Kidney Connect is a telephone-based peer support program available to all kidney patients and their caregivers. People can request to be matched with a trained peer support to discuss a variety of topics from dialysis choices to lifestyle issues to concerns about being newly diagnosed. The Kidney Foundation supports organ donation. To this end, we provide a reimbursement program for anyone who decides to be a living donor, kidney donor, or a liver donor. LODERP stands for Living Organ Donor Expense Reimbursement Program and aims to ensure that there is no financial barrier to being a living donor. Transplant social workers can provide more information and forms to candidates or living donors can contact us directly. Another way that we support living donors is through our Living Donor Mentor Program. 13 trained supporters who have been living kidney donors themselves are standing by and waiting to talk to any potential living kidney donor who may have questions about the process. All demographics are covered as we've trained both women and men of all ages and geographical locations. Some who have been anonymous donors, some who have donated to their children, parents, and some who've donated to a specific friend. Each summer, the branch provides a summer camp opportunity for young kidney patients. All camp fees are covered by us and children from all over BC and Yukon can enjoy a week of fun activities at Camp Latona on Gambier Island. We recognize the importance for children to spend time with others with similar kidney issues in a safe camp environment supported by nursing staff at BC Children's Hospital. Currently, the branch is offering four pilot initiatives that will be evaluated at the end of 2021 or mid-2022. We very much support patients who want to train to do home dialysis therapies and believe that there should be no financial burden to deter them. To this end, we offer the Northern Travel Pilot Program designed to cover accommodation and travel costs for those in Northern BC who need to travel to Prince George. All patients are eligible. There is no financial criteria. Similarly, we support kidney patients from Vancouver Island who need to travel to Nanaimo for home dialysis or peritoneal dialysis training by offering the kidney condo a fully furnished two bedroom apartment close to the hospital. Again, there's no financial assessment for a stay here and this residence is booked through a renal social worker. Many patients who are being assessed for a kidney transplant find themselves in a position where they may not move ahead with the process until they have a clean bill of health from their dentist. Unfortunately, some patients are unable to fulfill this requirement due to finances. We believe that no patient should be denied a transplant because they are low income. Consequently, we offer the Dental Pilot Initiative, whereby we will pay dentists directly for work done on qualifying kidney patients. And lastly, in collaboration with BC Renal, the Blood Pressure Monitor Initiative was developed. Any low-income patient who is affiliated with a kidney care clinic here in BC can access a free home blood pressure monitor as the importance of home monitoring is recognized by all. We are here to help. Please reach out to us directly with any questions or speak to your social worker. And now you know. You know, I know dialysis is it's it's a life-saving treatment, but it's also a huge change in a patient's quality of life. And I'm just wondering when you 
you know, when it when a patient realizes it's time that they need to start dialysis, are there common questions that you see from patients um, that uh, are common, I guess, concerns about how it's going to impact impact their life on a on a daily basis, their quality of life? Having to integrate dialysis into patients' lives is definitely a very big change in time commitment for a lot of patients. And many patients find it quite overwhelming um, to learn how to adapt to their new lifestyle with dialysis integrated into it. Um, we do have our multidisciplinary kidney clinics where we try to prepare the patients well in advance, months to years in advance of them requiring dialysis to ensure that they know what modalities of dialysis are available to them, what pros and cons of each dialysis modality is, and help tr to try to find the right modality for each of the patients. And this is of course just to ensure that once they do reach the need for dialysis that they feel a little bit more um, supported and that they know a little bit more um, about starting dialysis rather than crash starting into it and feeling even more overwhelmed than they need to be. Um, a lot of patients describe the experience as um, having to start a new part-time job on top of their usual work life and their family life when they need to start dialysis and having to shuffle around so many things around basically dialysis scheduling, which can definitely be um, a huge challenge. Um, but I think having the kidney care clinic uh, experience for the patients um, definitely help um, a lot of patients prepare for it uh, a little bit in advance. Um, and they find that it's more of integrating a new routine into their lives as opposed to, you know, crashing into something that they were not prepared for. So I think that's generally quite helpful. I think um, probably said it so well there. I think probably one of the biggest things for kidney patients is to know that while it is it is a, it's a huge change, they're not alone on this journey and they've got the, the support expertise guidance of their healthcare team and new developments in community resources and peer support. I think all of this comes together to play such a critical role for for kidney patients and um, their uh, their overall quality of life and, and hope for the future. Yes, so well thank you very much Dr. Park. We really appreciate you taking time to speak with us today on this special and Thanks for having me.